How's it going everyone? Ben here, your friendly neighborhood med student, and today we're going to be talking about how cancer screening guidelines are actually failing lesbian women in coming back and having their routine uh, cancer preventative screenings done. And when I say lesbian women, I mean all lesbian women, any person who identifies as a woman who is also attracted to other women, but more specifically, some most of this data that I'm going to be presenting today because of how dichotomous research can be, uh, particularly uh, hones in on the experiences of cisgender lesbians lesbian women, but I also want to point out the fact that trans lesbian women may also face these disparities. Actually, they're more likely <laughs> to experience these disparities and more likely to uh, face um, face harder times with these disparities. I don't want to get too bogged down by semantics for the purpose of this video. I think that'll just convolute things even further, even though I do think that nuances are important. But for the uh, context of this video, I am talking about people who identify as women who have sex with other people who identify as women and may or may not have a cervix, uterus, or uh, breast tissue that can develop into either breast cancer or cervical cancer. So let's quickly talk about the guidelines for everyone. I mean, everyone who uh, needs HPV testing and everyone who needs breast cancer screenings. So according to the US guidelines and what most primary care providers practice is that anyone from the age of 21 to 65 who has a cervix should get uh, HPV um, cervical cancer screenings done if they have a cervix. Um, that guideline, uh, a timeline depends on the age bracket you're in, but you're either going to get tested every three years or every five years. Now, when it comes to breast cancer, the general guideline is a, a, once a year after the age of 40. Some recommendations are once every two years, while other people who are more at risk uh, get mammograms earlier uh, than the age of 40. But in general, most people will get annual annual mammograms, uh, which is uh, an imaging of the breast tissue every year to detect for breast cancer. But time and time and again, we see that um, lesbian women are often misrepresented and underserved when it comes to cancer screenings. And it, it, it largely depends on two uh, main entities. The first one is the fact that lesbian women, because of um, social expectations and behaviors, uh, have certain risk factors that make them more at risk for developing these cancers. And the second one is um, is the lack of healthcare provider follow-up and the lack of acknowledgement and bias that a lesbian woman may face in the healthcare setting that prevents them from getting adequate care. So I'm going to explore number one and then explore number two. So for number one, some of the social and societal behaviors that can impact risk factors uh, among lesbians, I wanna emphasize that th this is very generalizable behavior patterns. Not all lesbian women participate in these behaviors. Not all lesbian women fit this description of what it means to be a lesbian. I think that's very, very important to say because I feel like a lot of it is very, uh, some of these views about lesbian women that uh, make them at risk can be uh, not very, not very inclusive of certain experiences that some lesbian women may have. So some of the risk factors uh, of developing cancer one is smoking. It's not just lung cancer that smoking can contrib contribute to. Smoking can contribute to actually both cervical cancer and breast cancer and a bunch of other cancers uh, too, like bladder cancer. But specifically for the experiences of lesbian women, we know that historically that um, certain populations of lesbians have uh, higher risks and higher um, social behaviors that contribute to tobacco usage. So, so, so um, we see certain populations of lesbians are more likely to smoke. And uh, the second thing is that alcohol consumption too is a risk factor for a lot of different cancers. And we see uh, historically in queer populations that uh, some some sub sub subsets of populations can also be more at risk for increased alcohol consumption. So these are very, very two important things that are uh, generalizable to queer experiences, which is more tobacco use and more alcohol consumption in the population that can lead them to being more at risk for developing these cancers. The third one, which I think is the most important, is the lifetime exposure to estrogen, specifically when we're looking at breast cancer. So we know that um, the more estrogen someone releases over their life, they are more likely and more at risk of developing breast cancer because estrogen, we know, 
in, in some forms of breast cancer is highly linked to developing that breast cancer. So um, funny enough, if someone is to, were to have kids uh, during those nine months when you are pregnant, your body actually releases less estrogen. So you have less lifetime exposure to estrogen. Also, if you have your period late, you are you you are less likely um, to develop breast cancer because you have less lifetime exposure. So uh, if you're getting at what I'm saying is that uh, the more years um, that you are exposed to your body producing estrogen, the more risk that you have. And we know historically that both lesbian and bisexual women are less likely to choose to have children. And if they do ha choose to have children, they have it over the age of 30. And we know um, from prior research data that people who have children, uh, who birth children before the age of 30, it is protective in some ways of breast cancer. So I've covered a little bit about uh, breast cancer risk because of lifetime exposure to estrogen. Now let's talk a little bit about HPV associated cancers because I think this is really important to emphasize the fact that um, there's a bit of a misconception among the lesbian community and it's been kind of um, kind of like promoted by the medical community that uh, the se the sexual behaviors of play with uh, partners between lesbians are less likely to transmit STIs um, that it makes really really um, narrow assumptions about lesbian identities now there's many lesbian women who realize that they are lesbian much later in life and they might have they might engage in play with a previous cisgender male partner they might also have a, a lesbian partner who is a trans woman so you do get exposure to different forms of genitalia and fluid exchange during play that can transmit hpv and cisgender women uh, cisgender women who have play with other cisgender women um, there is still fluid exchange that happens and you can also pass it on through saliva yes the risks are lower but that doesn't mean that the risks are eliminated and that's why screening is so 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 important regardless of your sexual orientation or and who's your current partner also vaccination is important uh, if you haven't seen my video on it the hpv vaccine it is amazing it is uh, one of the few vaccines in the world right now that can prevent cancer. So let's move on to part two of this video, which is bias uh, and discrimination that lesbian women face when it comes to seeing their doctor, which I think is more of an influence on why we are failing lesbian women in preventive cancer screenings and why more and more lesbian women are being diagnosed with cancer later in life. So the first thing I wanted to check is I wanted to see how bias and the behaviors of primary care physicians affected how uh, lesbian identified women were treated in the primary care setting, whether or not they were getting recommended for the HPV vaccine, whether or not they were getting tested for STIs, and whether or not they were recommended to get a pelvic exam and pap smear done. And I thought these results were interesting. So one study looked at 15,000 um, different women with different uh, sexual orientation identities, and they compared it to the um, control, which were uh, um, straight women, straight cisgender women, they are the ratio of one. So when we look at STI testing recommended to these women, we see that uh, lesbian women and along with bisexual women were more likely to be recommended to get STI screenings done than uh, heterosexual women. So I already see this uh, bias of seeing queer women as more promiscuous, so they need to get STI screening done. I've seen it in other studies. But then what gets really, really interesting to me is that, well, if you're making this assumption about queer women, I would assume that you would recommend them to get pelvic exams and HPV vaccinated. But when you look at those other two par parameters, lesbian women are less likely to be encouraged to have um, pap smears done and less likely to be encouraged to get the HPV vaccine. This honestly like blows my mind like and it infuriates me so much because the study is not old. It's not an old study, it's new. It was published in 2019 and looked at data from 2010 to 2016 and it wasn't just the regular general population out there. It was a study on nurses. 
that means these doctors knew that the patients that were coming in were healthcare, healthcare folk and still chose to be ignorant. The doctors that did decide not to recommend them the vaccination or uh, a pelvic and pap smear exam, they chose to do that. And that makes me scared about how much of a difference that makes for the patient population where doctors already make biases because they're not in the healthcare field. Another thing that completely blows my mind because of how recent the study data is, is the fact that the HPV vaccine has been around for decades and even in the last two decades, we have been recommending as national healthcare systems to make sure that everyone, regardless of gender, get vaccinated against HPV. And these doctors are electively choosing not to recommend it. I, I just, I'm at a loss for words on this study data. Like I have, it gets worse though. There's another study I really wanna focus on and here, here's what I have to say about them. In another smaller study that was presented by Dr. Kathleen Tracy at the American something something cancer conference, I will write it down below. I totally forgot what the name of it is, but uh, she also ended up publishing this data and that she saw that almost 70% of um, lesbian identified women who did not follow up with routine cancer screening is because of lack of referral from their physicians to get uh, that screening done. These two studies are not the only ones that have been conducted in the past couple of decades on how lesbian identified women are being impacted by this lack of acknowledgement to getting routine testing done and how it's impacting their health as they as unfortunately some may get diagnosed with these cancers later on in life. So I know, I know, I know these statistics are a bit jarring and frustrating for a lot of us to see, but I do want to emphasize the reason why I'm making this video is to make sure that if you are watching this video and you are not up to date with your cervical cancer screenings, or if you're considering getting the HPV, HPV vaccine, or if you are worried about your cancer risk is that you you take matters into your own hands because as minorities we kind of have to vouch for ourselves and that you go to your doctor and you do request those routine screenings if the doctor is not addressing it during your visits i know this is very frustrating because why should we be telling the doctor what to do if they know they went through the schooling to uh, tell us what we should get done but it is important for us to advocate for ourselves and that's why I made this channel and to advocate for your, you all to be informed to make those decisions yourself. So I hope as time goes on, we do more research because more and more research is being published. I feel like there's tons of research now that, that's being done on these disparities and that uh, not, is it, it's not just being published in research, it's being implemented into practice. And if it's not being implemented into, into practice, at least my videos and other advocates out there are helping you advocate for yourselves in getting these screenings and vaccinations done. Anyways, um, on a lighter note, I, I, hope, I hope this video helps. At least some of y'all uh, get your routine screenings done. And... Um, uh, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this content and I hope you'll share it with someone who may, be may benefit from this con um, content. I know it was long. <laughs> this video took a long time to make and research, but I'm very, very proud of this. And uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter to keep up with my daily life and activism work. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Mwah. This is Ben.